um, you can access this afterwards and we'll be sure to, uh, to give you a, a link to do just that. It also strikes me that most, one of the most important parts of what we're doing is reaching outside of now the 45 odd folks who have joined us for the webinar. Um, I, I do want you to encourage you to use your social media in a whole variety of ways. We've got all these new verbs in our lives now, all of these things we do naturally and intuitively. Um, we follow and tweet and pin and post and underscore and friend. Um, we defriend. You might hear something, you defriend someone. We email and we bookmark and repost. Um, please, uh, I encourage you to, anything that resonates with you, uh, blast out into your own social media network. Um, we do have uh, several Twitter handles that I'd love for you to, uh, to include if you do just that, and that includes Paul and his uh, university out in Oregon. And finally, you know, I think it's, uh, it's worth mentioning um, that tonight we've got actually uh, a slew of special guests, and I'm, I'm very much struck by the sense that in the virtual world we can bring together humanities educators from all corners of the United States. And as you think about the places we are and the, all the places you're sitting, uh, I don't think it's a trivial feat at all that one of our teacher advisory council members, Karen Baranek, uh, was dedicated enough and was um, inspired enough to pull together her faculty who would all come together and watch and view this webinar together. Um, of course, the big disadvantage that they have in Alaska and the Bering Strait is that the time zone is so different. So they had plans to all come together in the same room and they were all gonna watch the webinar and participate together. And then suddenly there was a, a big storm alert and the airport was shut down. And instead, Karen has taken it one step further to, um, to Google Hangout, this webinar that's now being sent out across Alaska. Of course, you know what, what we're really talking about is reaching in a very democratic and equitable way um, places where resources don't always, aren't always easy to come by. And so um, I really appreciate Karen's efforts in that. And if any one of you want to convene sort of a webinar uh, party like that, please let me know. Um, we'll be happy to, to work with you to do a group setting or a group uh, viewing in that regard. So that's my introduction. Um, again, I, I very much uh, appreciate that you're all with us tonight. Um, in a moment, I'm going to turn this over to, to Paul Otto, our, our guest. Um, Paul was a, a fellow with us in this past year. He and his wife, Lynn, spent the year in North Carolina working with the National Humanities Center. And I threatened him that I would ask, sort of ask around and get some of the stories that uh, sort of the behind the scenes stories as a way to introduce him tonight uh, about his time living and, and working in, uh, in the center. And I did actually ask around and I, I have to be honest with you, I was a little disappointed that I didn't come up with anything more salacious. Um, but as it turns out, it seems like uh, it seems like Paul was really the heartbeat of the center last year. As a matter of fact, I'm going to quote this for you, Paul. I was told that you and Lynn were the heart of center life. You are the most uh, voracious consumers of the library, and you gave one of the most fascinating project talks with a whole lot of show and tell. Um, your collection of wampum and other articles is not just intriguing, but we need plenty of time to get through it all. So now I suddenly feel a little shameful that I've taken way too much time introducing you. Paul, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to turn you turn uh, the toggle over to you now, and I'm going to invite you to um, to lead the session. Great. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Can you all hear me now? Yes, I think we can. Can anybody hear me now? Okay, great. <laughs> well, <I can. laughs> there, there they come. The yes, 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 yes. There you go. All right. Yeah, right. So um, it, it's uh, Andy. Uh, mentioned my wife Lynn. Lynn actually leads webinars. She's the expert. Uh, I'm sitting in my study and we share a wall from her workspace to my workspace. T typically I'm sitting in my study uh, trying to work. I was going to say quietly working although I usually have music on and then I get the little knock on the wall, turn the music down and then I hear her for an hour as she leads a webinar. So it's quite interesting that it's the other way around now. And This is a pretty new experience for me. Thank you all for being here and sharing your time. And, um, you know, I really feel like, well, I am the guest. Uh, and you're all coming in for the first time this year. and Maybe you'll participate uh, more or less as the year goes on. But, you know, this is for teachers. And as I've worked with teachers, and that'll be part of my introduction, I've become so impressed after having gone to graduate school and moved on to college education and 
kind of forgotten what it was like to be in the high school classroom or the junior high or whatever. I've been so impressed talking to teachers with uh, their level of dedication, their commitment to good teaching, to uh, enhancing their own knowledge and understanding and improving their pedagogy. I worked uh, for a few years as a consultant on some Teaching American History grants. Um, it was not the my was not the main thing. I was just one of the content experts, but I got to work closely with several of the, of the teachers, and I was just so impressed with that. So when I was asked last year to do this, I was quite pleased to say yes. We'll see if uh, what I have to say is of any benefit to you, but uh, I can at least say that I think you're fighting the good fight, and I encourage you to, to keep at the task. I know it's hard. It's often thankless. Uh, there are challenges with funding and uh, lack of community support and those kinds of things, but I do know that you're doing great work out there in the classroom, and I commend you for that. Okay, so I spent last year at the National Humanities Center basically working on this project, Wampum and the Shaping of Early America, uh, a project that does not lend itself to sort of immediate, um, you know, like when people ask me, what are you doing? I can't say, oh, you know, I'm working on the Great Awakening or I'm working on the coming of the Civil War. You know, people immediately know what you're talking about. So I kind of go around with this uh, inferiority complex and people say what are you working on and I kind of slump my shoulders and I say wampum and uh, because I don't know how to in like one or two sentences say how exciting and how interesting this topic is I I hope you'll find that it is it's going to be a window into m bigger things and that's how I got interested in the first place I was we're doing work years ago on Dutch Indian relations, the Muncie Indians in uh, the lower Hudson Bay. The Muncie Indians are in fact some of the people that made wampum and it was in working on that that I discovered that there was this whole other story to tell. So that's what I've been working on for more years than I, I care to tell you and what you're going to get tonight is, is kind of a taste of that. So that's a little bit about me and how I got on this topic. Let's move on forward if I can make this work. There we go. So before I kind of rough out the outline for you, that is a wampum belt that you see in this introductory slide. And I just like you, assuming you don't know anything about wampum, and that's fine, um, hopefully you'll know more shortly, what kind of thoughts come to mind as you look at this? Uh, I mean, any impressions you have at all? You know, what do you think it's used for? Um, you know, do you draw any conclusions about its manufacture, its significance, why people would think it's important? Uh, any of those, any of those thoughts? As you can see in the chat box below, uh, many of you are starting to chime in with your answers and descriptions. Please do that. When you hear Paul ask a question, although he's a little bit of a DJ on the radio right now, um, he is in fact asking you to respond. So please chime in. Karen, I see that you've raised your hand, and I appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we're going to do it Quaker style. When the spirit moves you, you you go ahead and uh, and, and and put your uh, your words in the chat. So I see a number of comments here about uh, the skill that goes into it. Uh, I see some about uh, craftsmanship and design, the intricate design, more than one. Um, and uh, and from the reading, you know that it's made from clamshells and uses money by the early Americans. Well, we're going to interrogate that thought. Um, it is indeed intricate, isn't it? I often get wrapped up in thinking some of the big cultural thoughts that Wampum points to. And though I've handled and I've looked at it, I, I sometimes forget the artistry and the heavy labor that goes into the, the, the loving labor, especially in the weaving of belts. Uh, I'm not going to say more about this particular piece because I don't want to privilege the unfolding of this story uh, with later information. Uh, so um, I'll leave it at that. And we'll, we'll see to what extent some of your observations connect with some of the things we have to I have to say today and uh, which which of them um, you know maybe get a little debunked or nuanced or problematized so um, as we go through today all these points are really about wampum but my um, 
intent here as we move forward with this talk is to look at the bigger question of how Europeans and Native Americans intersected in their cultures and how they interacted what the what the you know the meaning of that contact had for each of them it's a pretty grandiose title that I have wampum in the shaping of early America maybe a little too grandiose but insofar as the intersection of European and Native American society is at the heart of the creation of colonies in the 17th and then into the 18th century and wampum often plays a central role in that then yes I think it's fair to talk about wampum in the shaping of early America so I hope by the end of today you'll have a sense of these four things and probably many other things one and we'll get to this one right away is I want you to appreciate the difficulty of learning about native culture through European sources and you know I suspect some of you are Native American uh, of uh, ancestry or uh, hardly embrace a Native American culture. On that uh, point, I have to apologize a little bit for being, you know, just another white guy doing history that's, uh, in a way, historians who never do their own history. We're doing somebody else's history. But, but clearly there's a disjunction there between my own background and heritage and Native American history. Nonetheless, being trained as a historian, I understand the difficulties of reading sources, and I'm hoping to pass those on to you and getting a sense of a native perspective that might come through the sources if we read them carefully enough. I hope that you'll come away with an understanding of a little bit of Eastern Woodland Native American culture and wampum in particular. Um, I want you to get a sense of the intercultural nature of early American society. And finally, which is really a theme of my book, I want you to understand the continuity of wampum manufacture and use, that is how wampum stayed the same from the before contact to after contact, and the ways that wampum changed or evolved. And I can tell you right now, it was not a static artifact before Europeans came. It was already changing, and it continued to change, but with the uh, impact of Europeans and their trade and their expectations of Native Americans. Uh, and continue to be shaped both by Europeans and Native Americans through the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th centuries. So that's where we're going to go today. We're going to start with this document. This is from the voyage of Jacques Cartier. He was a French explorer. Um, this comes from a first-hand and first-contact account. Uh, Cartier was the first European coming into the St. Lawrence who recorded uh, his interactions with native people. And as far as we know and understand, uh, this was a first contact experience for native people. So I'll just read it. Uh, and pretty much out of context, but that's okay. We'll see what you can do with it. And after marching about a league and a half, we met on the trail one of the headmen of the village of Hokalaga accompanied by several Indians, who made signs to us that we should rest at that spot near a fire they had lighted on the pass, which we did. Thereupon the, this headman began to make a speech and to harangue us, which, as before mentioned, is their way of showing joy and friendliness, wel welcoming in this way the captain and his company. The captain presented him with a couple of hatchets and a couple of knives, as well as with a cross and a crucifix, which he made him kiss and then hung it about his neck. Yes, the headman is a Native American. He's what's being perceived by Cartier as a chief or a leader. So the question for you is, is based on this, what did the Europeans think? We're just going to draw that conclusion. It's relatively safe. What do Europeans think are the important elements of this social meeting? I appreciate that everyone is starting to type ferociously. Change of gifts, trade, gifts. <clears throat> Religion, tools, and social standing, Christianity. Yeah, these are these are good observations. I'm sure some more will come in as I'm chatting here. I think um, the trade and the exchange is an obvious one, and there are questions about whether 
Europeans see these as simply gift giving or whether or not it's trade as they would understand it that is an economic exchange I give you something of value you give me something back of value uh, but you see that these gifts are charged with more than just economic value but social and more particularly cultural value they're giving us giving them hatchets and knives and a cross and a crucifix and then the, cru the crucial point at the end, which he made him kiss and then hung it about his neck, proselytizing, although that hardly makes this native person a convert, even from the standpoint of the church. But there's lots going on here, and some historians would interpret this as, uh, as a question of, of power. So and this was not a question I put on there, but let's just think about this for a minute. Who is it that has the the real power in this meeting or who's exercising that power yeah I like this a power meeting yep. Yeah, which made him kiss. Good, good textual reading. There's other readings too going on. So some of you are saying the white men, but somebody else is mentioning the head men. Notice that the way Cartier or his scribe reports this, he says, thereupon this head man began to make a speech and to harangue us, which as before mentioned is their way of showing joy and friendliness, welcoming in this way the captain and the company. It's difficult to draw conclusions from this because this is being reported by a European explorer who has very little experience with native culture. But if you even go back a little bit and it says the Indians made signs to us that we should rest at that spot near a fire they had lighted on the path. They are the hosts the native people are. They're establishing the ceremonies. They're introducing Europeans into uh, certain social protocols. It's pretty hard to see that from this document if you don't know what else is going on and it's really easy to get the the second half of this little paragraph and to see what Cartier is doing. He is doing that but he is observing uh, native practices and recording them even if he doesn't necessarily understand them. So let's take a look at another account that's actually almost 200 years later but I assert to you that it is describing the same kind of social meeting but by somebody who has enough experience with native people to explain a little bit of what's going on and to see more of the details of what's going on. So this is from uh, John Heckewelder who was a missionary, uh, a Moravian missionary in the mid, -18, mid and late 18th century and from his book 30,000 Miles. He writes when this deputation had arrived, that is near the Indian villages, they made a halt for the purpose of having the customary ceremony performed on them, which being done by one of the counselors, one of the native counselors from the village, who by an address and with a string of wampum drew the thorns and briars out of their legs and feet, healed the sores and bruises they had received by hitting against logs, wiped the dust and sweat off of their bodies, and cleansed their eyes and, and ears, sorry, not ears, uh, so that they might both see and hear well. And finally, they anointed all their joints, that their limbs might again become supple. So now that you've heard this one and read it, how does that uh, make you read the er early one, or does it change the way you read the earlier one? Again, Paul, your prompt is bringing forth a lot of good answers. Yeah. Dueling, dueling keyboards, I'd say. Hmm. Almost like a baptism to welcome them into the community, get rid of impurity. 
you know, I can't match these up, Paul, but I would, I would love to have each of our participants with their home state in parentheses right next to their name. I, I wonder if geography helps or changes or somehow impacts the interpretation of things like this. It, it certainly can. Um, and people's own background, I'm wondering, you know, the connection with baptism and the Catholicism, whether those of you that brought that up have more intimate um, experience with Christianity, and so you see these connections. Yes, that they are the Native Americans. Well, I oh, actually, uh, when this deputation had arrived, they made a halt. The they, I don't remember now anymore, it's out of context, whether that was a European uh, deputation or not, but it would apply the same way. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. So all of these, yep, go ahead. No, no, please, I was just, go ahead. So all of these are, are positive uh, interpretations of what's going on. Indeed, it's a positive account. Um, and it makes absolutely clear this host role that the Indians are playing. It doesn't give any sense of what the Europeans are doing here. But if you can now imagine, if you yourself are in this party and, you, and you're coming to a village and then you're met at the edge of the village and you might sit down and then there's this individual who who speaks to you and gives an address and he uses a string of wampum and he goes through this ceremony which is sometimes known as the the three word ceremony he's kind of done this reported this as a four word ceremony typically it's to uh, wipe away your tears to clear your ears of any rumors you've heard and to salve any of the wounds that you've picked up and that three strings of wampum would, would be used, one for each of those points. I think that, I, I wish people would welcome me like that, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, I think that this is exactly what's happening when Cartier enters this village of Huron people who actually used wampum 200 years before. He doesn't understand the ceremony. Yes, it's a welcoming and all that, but he doesn't see all of the social significance, the even religious significance that some of you have picked up, um, even though his own exchange of goods or giving of goods does have clear religious significance. So then my question is, you know, as you think about this, how do you feel about, or, or what do you think, let's put it this way, about the reliability of sources as we try to understand native culture and the, and the encounter between Europeans and Indians? You know, sometimes, sometimes, Paul, when I'm working with younger students, I like to draw the distinction in sources, whether they're material culture or documents between records and relics. The difference being that records are created presumably so that others in the future will see them and make sense of what's happening. Relics being something that's just part of our daily life and there's no real explicit understanding that someone else is going to interpret them in some way. Uh, I wonder if as as which of these these might fall into because in some ways they sort of seem to be both. Yes, yes. I think written documents often um, can fall into what uh, you would say intentional or unintentional categories, and sometimes sometimes at both at the same time. So uh, Cartier may be reporting um, in very intentionally about his encounter with natives. But what he really cares about is, you know, whether this land is good to settle in and whether there's trade possibilities and whether or not the St. Lawrence is accessible or is a form of access to the Pacific Ocean or somewhere else. Right. And all of his re accounts about the native people are, are incidental. So that's an important first step. And then another step, as many people are picking up on, is there's there's a perspective issue here. Um, so you don't discount what they write because they don't understand Native people, but you certainly have to understand that because they don't have an appreciation or an intimate knowledge of Native culture, they're going to miss things or misinterpret and misrecount the kinds of things they do. I, I was sharing these two uh, pieces with my wife and said, well, clearly this first one is what's going on in the second one. She said, well, how, how you know, I, she's, she learns by questioning. So I, she, 
I often feel on the defensive with her, and she says, "Well, how can you say that? You know, because th it's just two different things." Well, you say that you, I can say it because one of the things historians do is they read a lot of sources, and I've probably read scores, if not hundreds, of these kinds of edge of the woods or three word ceremonies, and reading back the Cartier piece, it's kind of like, oh, that's exactly what's happening. Knowing that the native people he's interacting with are wampum users, and even if they didn't have wampum, because it isn't always used in the ceremony, you just understand that this is part of the social encounter. And in fact, social exchange is key to native culture. And once you know that, you tend to read these documents very differently. If you're reading it through the same eyes as the Europeans do and you're thinking about trade, you might miss the exchange of goods as a simply economic exchange. So, so these are great questions and interaction that I'm seeing kind of fly by here on the chat screen. I encourage you to keep it up. And, uh, and Andy will, will make sure I get the really pertinent questions <laughs> and, and address I will. Them. I will. I'll make sure every single question is answered. <laughs> well, I don't know if we'll have time for that. So, um, and we do have to move on. So, uh, I wanted to take some time to really delve into that. Um, we'll take some of these sources a little more at face value, but be aware of what's going on and try to read through them. Okay, so when I say face value, I mean we'll, we won't interrogate them in terms of questioning them, but do try to read through them. So, a, a little bit on native wampum use. And there's some debate about the degree to which wampum existed before Europeans came. Uh, it certainly wasn't widespread, but there was some um, some beads, uh, shell beads, and lots of shell product that was used by all kinds of Native Americans. But we're talking about Native people in the Northeast. And we're particularly talking about the Iroquois. Now, we're going to read this. Um, but this is a, an account that's recorded in the late 19th or early 20th century. And many of the oral traditions about the origin of the Iroquois League and their use of wampum are recorded much later. So it's really hard for us to know when these things happened or how much this is mythology. Uh, but, it, but at the same time, it does demonstrate the role of wampum in uh, Indian culture and what they think about it. So here's this account. These shells uh, in this oral tradition are the rules of life and the laws of good government, said Hiawatha. Hiawatha was the figure, historical or mythological, who founded the, the Iroquois League. This string of white shells is a symbol of truth, peace, and goodwill. This string of black shells is a symbol of hate, war, and bad faith. This string of alternating black and white beads is a symbol of peace, a symbol that peace should exist between nations. And this string with white on one on either end and black in the middle is a sign that all war must end. So based on a little bit of what you've heard already and seen and reading this, how does wampum or shell serve as rules of life and the laws of good government? Mm -hmm. Symbolism. And yes, black is purple. Just to answer that, we might come we'll probably come back to that. And it is more valuable, but I don't know that economic value plays a role here. A symbolistic mind reminder. Colors used to symbolize particular aspects. Uh, interesting observation. Conflict between groups is normal, but peace is preferable. Reminds me of something I read in Immanuel Kant earlier today, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so, the law, so the rules of life and the laws of good government are kind of about all of these things. But let's just focus on this, the white ones. A string of white shells is a symbol of truth, peace, and goodwill. How does that stand out from really all the rest of them? And I guess I'll, I'll just add the follow-up question. Why is it the white and not the dark that is the symbol of truth, peace, and goodwill?
See Becky and El both making the same preposition. Yeah, I think purity is certainly a possibility. Color significance is important, and it's difficult for us to fully get a grasp of that. But this this notion that's being expressed here is not unique to the Iroquois. Um, interesting studies have shown that groups of people who have only two colors in their in their language have a one word for light and one for dark and light always is associated with positive states of being and dark black in this case purple is associated not with negative states of being but you might say asocial states of being and so white and we don't know if it's because it's this general idea uh, but but in the case of wampum, the original wampum are white shell beads. They come from seashells. They come from the ocean. The ocean is a source of life. Uh, it's also a vast place. In fact, native uh, and Iroquois origin myths have to do with a, a, a include a creation story of having Earth being brought up from under the water, and then a land is created, and they're placed on the land. So. Insofar as shell and white shell is associated with the ocean, uh, there's a lot going on there in terms of life, renewal, restoration, rebirth, a number of things like that. Good observations on the colors, and I appreciate that. I think there's a, a lot of that kind of universal dark white uh, thing going on there. OK, let's move on. I, tell that we've got a long way to go and not a lot of time to get there. Um, we're going to look at a few more things about native culture and use. And here we have uh, an Iroquois funeral. This is from the 18th century, but we have archaeological evidence that shows this kind of thing happening at least in the 17th century, and maybe earlier. And if you can't see it or don't recognize it, this is the wampum belt right here. So why do you think wampum would be interred with a corpse? Afterlife is a good observation. I think you'll see here that there's a pipe, there's a quill, a uh, bow, there are feathers, a jar. All of those things make sense to accompany somebody into the afterlife. Yes, the ceremony of it. And um, it, it, unlike European observations that natives are just savages, that there's, you know, they don't have rituals, they don't have religion. No, they do lots of things that are highly symbolic. And so, yes, there are burial ceremonies, some really fascinating ones that we could get into if we had the time. Travel and peace. Yes, so this isn't just accompanying into the afterlife with goods, but in fact, these are goods that are helpful. And a white, as it mostly is wampum belt, is going to be a positive thing. It would be less likely that you would inter them with a dark belt. Some other kinds of things that might function here that you wouldn't be apparent from looking in the photo. Sometimes uh, prestige goods, as wampum belts were at first, uh, would be buried with a high-ranking individual. Eventually, wampum was so widespread, along with many European goods, that everybody was buried with these things. Another um, reason that things might be buried with somebody uh, might have to do with their own trade craft. So wampum makers that lived on the coast would often be buried with their tools and some wampum beads. Next we have um, a description of a marriage custom from a Dutch a colonial official. He, just, he writes that they have a marriage custom amongst them, namely when there is one who resolves to take a particular person for his wife, he collects a fathom or two of zewan, the, Dutch word, the word the Dutch used for wampum, and comes to the nearest friends of the person whom he desires, to whom he declares his object in her presence, and if they are satisfied with him, he agrees with them how much zewan he shall give her for a bridal present. That being done, he then gives her all the Dutch beads he has and also all sorts of trinkets. So the question is, what, does, what role does wampum play in native marriage customs? Dowry, wampum equals dowry.
Good faith, dowry. Hmm. Oh, there's a currency there, it seems, a, a value that's being articulated. Dutch. Giving of the self, good faith, choice of mate. Bride price. might play a role here but this could also be an issue of um, of uh, sealing a relationship perhaps even uh, sealing or binding two different family groups through marriage and the wampum is is symbolically and ceremonially charged for that okay um, is there a now uh, Paul, yep. Paul if, you, if you don't mind um, there's a question here from yeah, Pat Marshall please. Um, he's going to his nearest friends, not family. Is that significant in some way? Oh, um, yes and no. Now I've got to interrogate that part of it. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I'm not prepared to answer the question or to draw a conclusion from that. Um, that could be a, an issue with the uh, European observer not knowing it, uh, it could be that there are go-betweens that the that the, the Durasere is observing, interpreting as a as friends. Uh, there are clan issues though too that you would probably marry. It's they have ex these are Munsi people's exogamous marriages, so you would marry outside of your immediate family or clan. Um, so not sure about that. Very good question though. So quickly uh, on manufacture here, another Dutch observer say that wampum is made of conch shells. It's actually whelk, which are cast up by the sea about twice a year and taken from it. The Indians knock off the thin shell, the thin shell wall all around, keeping only the middle standard or pillar that is surrounded by the outer shell. These they grind smooth and even and trim according to whether the pillars are thick or thin. They drill a hole in each string it through tough stalks and file them down to equal size. Finally, they restring the sticks on long cords and issue them in that form. And the photo uh, demonstrates not the work being done, but the stages from big pieces of shell down to a bead, the, the little bead right here, that uh, eventually will get standardized to about a quarter of an inch long by an eighth of an inch across. So it's you can't the length is this way. And, the diameter is this way. So what does this process of wampum manufacture reveal about native culture and the place of wampum in it? Mm. Yeah, the care is yeah. obvious. Yeah. Incredibly time consuming. I actually tried to make some beads, some shell beads. And it took me a couple hours to make some bead blanks, five or six, and then we only successfully drilled through one. And we were using, you know, power tools. <laughs> uh, and even then, the bead that we produced was pretty, pretty bad. Uh, not that I expected to make a, a perfect bead as a as a first time out at the uh, at the craft. Um, it's hard to know how many beads would be made in a day if we were counting by day. Um, it could be maybe as many as a hundred early on. Uh, there's a question about European tools that are used afterwards, and then stone tools. Believe it or not, beforehand, they uh, native people would make microlithic tools, so very small stone drills, and uh, and could drill these beads out by drilling them from either side. But think about that. You have to make the drills. You have to make the tools you need. You have to harvest the shell. Well, the shell is pretty easy to harvest. And then you have to go through this whole process. 
So uh, in, incredible amount of labor that goes into this. Now, there could be an economic piece to this. Um, certainly, it's, it, it's valued by people inland and the people on the coast are the ones making it. But I don't think it's just an economic proposition here. So even when we don't see economics at play the way we might see in Western culture, we can see that heavy labor is involved in something people have a deep appreciation for. And it's not clunky labor. It's careful, fine labor. Mm -hmm. The earlier beads are less uniform than later ones, but they're still remarkable to look at and to, to imagine them being made by hand with stone tools. So this is a map that actually gets at what I was just describing. At the time of when the Europeans first arrived, it was uh, these native people here, the Pequots, the Niantics, the Narragansetts, uh, people across the Sound on eastern Long Island that made wampum. Some people over here in De Muncie territory also made wampum, but they were not the primary users. The primary users were, were so the, here's the makers here, the primary users are Iroquoian speakers. The Huron up here, the Five Nations the Iroquois, the Susquehannock, some other people on the fringes who weren't necessarily uh, Iroquois users, and, and probably well over among the, uh, the Penobscot and other Algonquin speakers out here. They're kind of in that orbit. But it's all being made down here, and it's being shipped inland. That's happening before Europeans come. Um, not in large numbers, but certainly there are some beads being made along the coast, and, and it's shipped here. Okay. So we're going to move on to something I call the wampum revolution. And basically, the long and the short of it is, when Europeans come, things change drastically. Um, and I'm going to try to highlight those changes by looking at a few documents. But the Europeans we're talking about, just to go back here, uh, although we'll see another map forward, are the English who settle here in New England. This is uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Rhode Island, Connecticut, and then this whole area actually from the Connecticut River down here into what's now New Jersey or even Delaware is claimed by the Dutch. Um, or if we look at the map here, the English are here and the Dutch are here. That's something you need to keep in mind because obviously they've landed unintentionally un, uh, or and ignorant of um, this wampum production area. And one of the oh, themes uh, of native, yep, yeah, go ahead. Let me ask you real quickly. Chris from New York is asking, uh, and <clears throat> I think it's queued up partly by the visual of the map you just shared. What do inland people trade in return? You know, we don't have a good fix on that. Food items uh, were probably exchanged. The Iroquois were uh, big producers of maize. Uh, and other agricultural products. Um, they only expanded that over time. There are a number of goods. And this is a great question because goods are, are transported over hundreds or even thousands of miles as they pass from one group to another, usually through some form of ceremonial exchange. So there could be stone that's coming from places that, that you know, that's good stone for tools that wouldn't be available to people on the coast. Uh, inland copper makes its way from as far west as the Minnesota region and travels down to, to people. So, you know, so when um, uh, Verrazano meets people on the coast, he finds that they have copper. And some people thought, oh, well, people had already been, Europeans been trading copper, but it was probably native copper that they'd gotten from inland. So there's a number of things that are going on that are being exchanged back and forth. Thanks for that. So here's a, Here's a, um, a description by de Rosser Whitray. He was the secretary of the colony, so which was headquartered right down here in New Amsterdam. But the Dutch, in fact, claimed at least as far east as here, and really to a certain extent all the way over here. Um, and hopefully you're looking at the slide in my cursor. This red line on this map is not only sort of the extent of how far east the Dutch traded, but it is also the extent of wampum manufacture. That's partly because the shells, the whelk and the clam 
uh, the welcome especially don't exist above Cape Cod. It kind of stops right through here. So he's writing about a trip here at Buzzards Bay, okay, which is over here. Also, they, the English, have built a shallop, a, a boat, in order to go and look after the trade in Zewan in Sloops Bay, which is over here and thereabouts, because they are afraid to pass Cape Malabar. They don't want to go around, so they want to have a little place here. And in order to avoid the length of the way, which I have prevented for this year, I prevented them doing this by selling them 50 fathoms of Zewan or wampum, because the seeking after Zewan by them is prejudicial to us. Inasmuch as they would do, they would by doing so discover the trade in furs, which if they were to find out, it would be a great trouble for us to maintain. For they already dare to threaten that if we will not leave off dealing with the people, they will be obliged to use other means. I won't finish the rest of it, but why is wampum so important to the Dutch? So I'm asking you, and you're asking me. <laughs> Cheryl says, "What did Europeans value wampum for?" Well, let's see if we can figure it out. I can tell you they weren't, they, uh, seems like jewelry. It, it does seem like jewelry, but they were not shipping it back to Europe. I'll, t I'll give you that much. Diana says in trade with other tribes, key to the beaver fur trade. The fur trade more important, so a ruse. Uh, so how, if, if, if it has something to do with the fur trade, what, what does it have to do with the fur trade? Uh, somebody asked about the Beaver Wars, Mary. Uh, this is the beginning of the Beaver Wars, and some people would say the so-called Beaver Wars that it, that it leads into them. Trade with inlanders, trade with others, trade with inlanders. Yeah, uh, lots of these comments are getting at it. But remember that before the D English show up here, the Dutch show up here, these people on the coast are making wampum and they are trading it to the Iroquois. Now, what you don't know is that the furs primarily are coming from the Iroquois, from people inland. There are furs available on the coast, but that supply gets exhausted pretty quickly. And the Dutch discover that of all the goods that they can trade to the native people, for the Native Americans, the Iroquois, excuse me, for, for, uh, for furs, of all those, wampum is what they want. And so the Dutch insert themselves as middlemen here. And they trade European goods to the Muncie and other Indians along the coast. They trade them wampum. And then the Dutch ship the wampum up here. And out of Albany, they trade it for furs. That's going to have a huge impact on the coastal people. They will become quickly dependent on Europeans, using European tools to produce wampum. Uh, it's also going to create a huge conflict between the English and the Dutch, because the English do discover that wampum, or that 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 uh, yeah, that wampum's important to the fur trade, and they want to get in on it. You may be surprised that the Dutch claimed all of this area. This is Rhode Island now. This is Connecticut. Rhode Island and Connecticut exist um, in many ways because of the English effort to capture wampum. And so there's a massive war in the 1638s called the Pequot War. Uh, the English go to war against the, the Pequot people. They subjugate them, the Pequots, and then eventually the Narragansetts are forced into a tributary status with the English. They're forced to produce wampum by millions of beads a year. And, and the Pequots and the Narragansetts put these people on the, co on the Long Island Sound or excuse me, on Long Island, Eastern, in the Hamptons, um, put them under their thumb, and they force them to produce it. And we get this huge power shift that takes place. So this is why we call it the Wampum Revolution. Lots of things going on. And, uh, and then William Bradford has a wonderful description of it. And strange it was to see the great alteration it made in a few years among the Indians themselves. For all the Indians of these parts had none or very little of it, but the sachems that wore a little of it for ornament. Only it was made and kept among the Narragansetts and Pequots, 
which grew rich and potent by it. This is actually a little before the Pequot War. And after it grew thus to be a commodity in these parts, these Indians fell into it also. And it hath now continued a current commodity about these 20 years, and it may prove a drug in time. In the meantime, it makes the Indians of these parts rich and powerful and also proud thereby, and fills them with pieces, powder, and shot, which no laws can restrain. So I asked the question here of how did the commodification of wampum transform native society, but I want to ask a different one first. Now that we've thought about how to read these sources, what does this source tell you about Bradford's attitude about Native Americans? When you ask that, if you have a moment to actually pull out a part of the passage or a few choice words or a phrase that backs up your, your assumption and conclusion, please do. These are good observations about the uh, the change to native society. That's great. Yes, which no laws can restrain. That doesn't sound very positive about native people. Brady, Bradford sees them as haughty, and why? What you know? Why not? <laughs> Prove a drug in time. Yeah, lots of these things he's concerned with. He's concerned with them being armed. He's concerned with them having a, an attitude. He's concerned with them being hooked on it, interestingly enough. Uh, but these are all rather patronizing observations, aren't they? Right? I mean, after all, whose land is this? Right? This is the Pequot and the Narragansett land, and they are making wampum that they have done for who knows how long. And now Bradford's saying, wow, what a change is going on. He's observing the influence of Europeans and the fur trade on the native people and he's sort of blaming native people for succumbing to these these wampum changes but the commodification of wampum actually comes from the Europeans turning it into an economic ex good of exchange rather than a social good of exchange um, and I think it's I think it's uh, important to keep in mind this kind of a patronizing, really imperialistic attitude. The, the Europeans are claiming the territory. They think, you know, God brought them there one way or another, you know, right of discovery, all these kinds of things, and uh, really just naturally assume that native people should be subject to them. Now, the English feel this way and express it much more strongly than the Dutch do, but after all, their maps of the area look like European maps, not like Indian maps, right? They're, they're laying out the boundaries, and those boundaries don't take into account tribes other than, oh yeah, there's those Indians living out there, but they see them as people who will be moving on, hopefully in time. Great comments that I'm seeing as they go by. So to, to get at the another aspect of the revolution, and this is really crucial here, I've got two slides with just a lot of images. And my question here is, just based on this one, images more or less from before 1630, how do you describe the physical qualities of wampum? This is a string uh, from an archaeological setting before 1630. Uh, this is from an early French document, and the women here are wearing wampum. It's probably wampum in their, also in their hair, um, and she's got wampum. This is the seal of New Netherland, and it has a wampum string around, and it has a beaver in the middle. And then the proposed coat of arms for New Netherland has a, a, a wampum belt, apparently, in the background, and a beaver in the middle. Yes, wampum is obviously important to both cultures. No, the beaver's not made from wampum. They're seeing they're clearly seeing the connection though. Their colony is founded on the the trade of, of wampum for beavers. Yeah. I saw somebody mention the importance of display. And that's true, is it not, for both the native people and in a sense for Europeans, although Europeans aren't wearing wampum, but they're using it to symbolize their possession of the territory. Um you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, these are just European seals. But think about these seals. They wouldn't look like this 
in Europe, they have the symbols of North America. Um, they can't escape the native practices of wampum production and, and the cultural use. So let's, can we dig deeper? When, if, what's one thing that's common about every single one of these representations of wampum, all four of these pictures here? Actually, it's, it's maybe not that deep. Maybe it's an obvious thing to ask. We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> nice observation about the tobacco leaf. That does happen, too. OK, well, they're all white. These beads are all white. And I could show you a number of documents to go along with that. And I could show you the archaeological evidence besides just this one photo. Before 1630, virtually the only beads you'll find are white, made from whelk. Hmm. Now, take a look at after 1630. I don't even have to ask you how it differs. Well, I can. Uh, clearly, there's dark beads. What else is happening as a result of these dark beads? Mm, patterns, right. Patterns, patterns, patterns. Yes, belts and patterns. Probably some small belts existed, um, and belts were used in a similar fashion. But once the dark beads um, are innovated, Native people apparently did it, but they needed European tools because the quahog clamshell is much harder or more brittle than the whelk. Once they had European tools, they could make dark beads. And once they could make dark beads, they made more and more elaborate belts with more and more elaborate patterns. And you can see the evolution of these patterns over, over time, Yeah, not just single strands. Single strands are very common. They'll continue to be used. Um, but dark beads, the emergence of dark beads, as far as I can tell, comes as a result of contact between Europeans and Indians. Wasn't a European idea, but European tools made it possible. So part of the wampum revolution. As an employment in their winter, they make zaywan, which is an oblong bead, yada, 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 yada. Um, they consider it as valuable as we do money here, since one can buy with it everything they have. They string it and wear it around the neck and hands. They also make bands of it, which the women wear on their forehead, under their hair, and the men around the body. And they are as particular about the stringing and sorting as we are here about pearls. So what do you think about their two versions of value, Native American and wampum notions of value? Are they the same, or are they different? By the way, I see this question about was the, the darker was scarcer, so mo more valuable. I think that's true. Uh, it tended to trade at two for one, two white beads for one dark bead, uh, although that ratio would change over time. But it was harder uh, to make the dark beads. The purple on the quahog clamshell was uh, more rare. And so I think there's a simple uh, a scarcity value, uh, mm -hmm. theory value of labor going on there. Not sure if we've gotten to your question there, Paul. It's um... <clears throat> no, that's okay. There's a couple of good ones that have gone by. Uh, women tended to weave belts. Uh, men and women both made the beads, although the making of beads was originally men. Um, so I see a couple of comments that go by that make some that are addressing it. So let me just quickly observe. It's real common for Europeans to say things like. Uh, they consider it as valuable as we do money here. They can buy anything with that we have with it. Okay, they they are as particular about the string sorting as we are of pearls. You see these comparisons with gold and silver and pearls and precious jewels time and time again, and and it's given rise to this belief that wampum was Native American money, but it did not get used as money insofar as money is a currency that goes both directions. It's, it's a universal unit of exchange. Wampum is not a universal unit of exchange, except after New, New England and New Netherland are founded and the wampum becomes so important, the 
Europeans use it as a local currency, and the Indians will use it as a local currency with uh, Europeans. But among themselves, Native people continue to use it in much of the way they did. But in this case, with these Indians are, who are probably Lenape's, cousins of the Muncies, down in the Delaware Valley, they are newly, they have new access to wampum that they didn't have before. And it, it is commodified, and they're living the good wampum life. I mean, this is not how they would have looked in 1600 when they didn't have access to wampum. I don't think they're wearing it because they think of it as money and they're showing off their wealth in that sense, but they're certainly um, expressing um, a deep appreciation for it and and demonstrating that their material life has considerably improved after contact with Europeans. And when I say that, I only mean their material life. That doesn't mean everything else is good as a result of that, but I do mean that they have a lot more material goods than they did. Paul, my shame is returning um, in earnest as I see that the time is 8.15 now, East Coast time. So we'll take a, you know, about uh, 10, 12 more minutes. Um, I know where you are in your in your outline here. So I don't want to truncate what you're sharing, but I do want to keep us on our time, time slot. Um, it, we already know that wampum is being used in social exchange with native people in a number of ways. What Europeans figure out pretty quickly is that um, the building of alliances and the keeping of friendships all has to do with wampum users with the exchange of wampum. And there's lots of ways that this happens. They do it by uh, certifying, they use it in the, the edge wood, uh, wood uh, the Woods Edge Ceremony that we talked about before. They use it as uh, certificates for messengers. It's like, oh, I have this belt from so-and-so. I'm the ambassador. You can accept me. They use them as carrying messages. Uh, they don't have to have patterns to carry a message. It's a mnemonic device. But when patterns come along, the patterns uh, are adapted to these messages or vice versa. And then, to a certain extent, they are used to kind of record or memorialize meetings. That's a little dicier. Uh, I think it's not quite the way we would understand it. Wampum belts don't really take the place of treaties, but as we'll see, they are held as remembrance kinds of pieces. So I have one account here just of how the native people do it, and, and I'll talk through this one quickly. Uh, but this is a Jesuit in the 1640s describing a meeting of Indians. The assembly of these Indians was held in a hall an hour, the Jesuits' little house, their little building. It was opened by the exhibition of the presents, which were stretched upon a cord extending quite across the hall. This picture, by the way, kind of describes this, but it doesn't go exactly with this quote. They consisted merely uh, of porcelain collars of great size. Porcelain is the French way of describing wampum. The oldest of these ambassadors began to speak and said to all present that he came to manifest the affection and friendship of the peoples of this nation as symbolized by these collars, belts, and that in his words were seen their inmost thoughts. Thereupon, taking another large collar, he stretched it out in the middle of the room. This collar was composed of white and violet colored porcelain, so already the influence of color in the 1640s, and so arranged as to form figures which this worthy man explained after his own fashion. So typically you would have uh, a group of native people coming to another group and they would bring a number of strings and belts of wampum. And then as they would speak, uh, they might hang them all up ahead of time and they would go from one item to the next and they would pick up the belt and they would speak over the belt. And the belt would, in a sense, contain a message. It didn't literally contain it. They, the speaker had the message memorized and he knew which belt it went with. Sometimes if the pattern closely corresponded with the message, they might even sort of theatricize that. They might let the belt kind of unfold as they speak, and you would see the pattern revealed as it would go along. Um, there's not as many descriptions of this as I would like. This is actually a nice early one. Um, most of the time you have, uh, when the Europeans are recording this, They'll record the speeches, and then at the end, they'll simply say, gave a belt, or gave a prodigious large belt. Well, you're going to see one of those. And I've seen hundreds of these, gave a belt, gave a string, gave a dark belt. 
Um, but this is what they're talking about. So let's look at this in the context later in the 18th century of an encounter between Europeans and Indians. And again, this photo is uh, representative but does not correspond directly with this account. So here's this native person. He's speaking to Sir William Johnson, the superintendent for Indian affairs in the Northern District. He was headquartered outside of Albany. And the speaker, redhead, uh, an, an air coin, I believe, picks up a large belt, which the general gave, with an emblem of the Six Nations, the Iroquois, joined hand in hand with us, so he describes the belt, Brother Waranga Yage, that's the name for William Johnson, it means a person doing great deeds. Look with attention on this belt and remember the solemn and mutual engagements we entered into when you first took upon your management of our affairs. Be assured we look upon them as sacred and shall on our parts punctually perform them as long as we are a people. So, what purpose does this belt serve? And you can focus just basically on this last paragraph here. The belt is definitely a symbol, that's right. Part of the covenant chain. And the covenant chain, for those of you that don't know, is a, a long-standing relationship between the English and the uh, and the Iroquois. And sometimes there are belts that are referred to as the covenant chain belt. So Cheryl, you say Redhead values the belt far more than the European. How does he value it? What does it mean to him? And somebody else can answer it too. We don't have to wait for Cheryl. Oh, multiple attendees are typing. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, a promise and an obligation. It's exactly right. And notice it's the native people. I mean, they're saying it here to Johnson, but they're saying we look upon this belt as sacred and on our parts we'll punctually perform our obligations, the things that we agreed to when this belt was given before. That's right. I'm going to rush us through here. Now here's from the same meeting. And in this case, they say, hey, look, we have this belt that the governor gave us many years ago, and we hope our brethren, the English, will seriously remember the promises made by us by this belt and exactly perform them, and we promise them to do the same. So the same thing, but he's saying, we expect you to do it. This belt is binding both of us, okay? And we know the belt does because we only have our memories and the memories are contained in the belt. Well, I've got an image here that again isn't the same event but look what's going on here and think about that question of power that we asked a long time ago. What does this image say basically about power between British and natives on the frontier? That's a nice thought. Yes, the British do look that way, don't they? It, it, they, they at least look equal. I, it's hard to know all of what Benjamin West was was thinking here, but I, my, you know, my sense is the image is is as much showing native power as anything else. I mean, the native uh, speaker here is the center. Uh, we've got these people sort of cowering back a little bit. He's speaking over this belt. Uh, if you take this image along with what we read before, just think about their, their asserting their sovereignty, really, over these frontier diplomatic processes. And Colonel Bouquet didn't really get it. The image doesn't show you how much he actually resented all this. Um, but, uh, uh, but this, I think, image, though, made by European has a good sense of how Native people fell, felt about the frontier and their relationship with the Europeans, always holding them or trying to hold them, reiterating their past agreements. Yeah. Okay, I got 
one last thing, and that's to talk about European American Wampum Industry. And we're going to skip through one and go to this last slide. And notice this description of how it's being made in the 18th. No, I can't do that yet. I got to go back one. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> notice this one here. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Indians formally made their own wampum though not without great difficulties. But at present, in the 1750s, it is made mostly by the Europeans, especially by the inhabitants of Albany, who make a considerable profit by it. And then, the quote on the bottom is the same one on the next slide. And then this one, come on, it says, the wampum is made of the clamshell by Europeans, a shell consisting of two colors. The process of manufacturing is very simple. It's first clipped to proper size. It's made this long parallel pipette, uh, then drilled and afterward ground to a round smooth surface. So how does wampum manufacture in the mid-18th century compare with the early 17th century? Mm, it's inflation, that's right. You gotta be quick, guys. Almost, um, but is it mechanized? I mean, look to the right here and read this. Reread this description we had before of native people. On the left, we have the the shells are clipped to the proper size, and the right, we have to knock the thin shell off all around, keeping the pillar. We have them grinding smooth on both sides. We have them drilling on both sides. There's nothing here about power tools, not that they existed. Oh, the terminology has become more technical. I I think you could say that, um, although that's that's a hard observation to make because you've got different observers writing, different social stances, you know, it's 150 years apart. It is possible as as Karen just said, that there's no longer um, a, a kind of pride of workmanship. Um, but I would I I'm not convinced that we can get this out of the document, and the other documents don't um, don't uh, say that either. Uh, the only difference I see in these is that Europeans are making it instead of Indians, but the and it's clam instead of whelk. But otherwise you'll find that they're making it in pretty much the same way as native people are. Now, the bigger revolution, yeah, revolution happened when native people started making it year-round and were using European tools. But once that happened, and you get the description you have in the 1650s, that's what continues on with the change that it's Europeans that begin making it. And does it get mechanic mechanized? Yes, interesting enough. In the 19th century, when it's being made to ship out to the Western tribes, and it's not really wampum because it doesn't function in the same way, um, you've got these several people in New Jersey, prominently these four brothers, who have a little wampum factory, and they've got a water mill, and they use uh, water-driven tools, and they're cranking these beads out, and it's simply an economic occasion. But in the 18th century, you've got Europeans that are making it, and they are making it for the traditional use of, of wampum, the Iroquois. So when you th see all those belts, and you see all of what's going on in the frontier with the diplomacy and the interaction, those belts are being made primarily by European workers. Some of them are actually craftsmen. They call themselves wampum makers. Sometimes they're just working for others. Uh, they might be doing it as uh, what we call uh, in a putting out system. Some merchant brings somebody a bunch of shells, and then they break the shells, and he takes the broken shells to somebody else. And they, and in that sense, it is kind of industrialized a little bit. Um, but it's not a true factory. And, and the beads are essentially made in the same traditional way and they're certainly being used in a traditional way. And why Europeans are appropriating a manufacturer? Um, because the population is big enough and there's enough work 
to make that valuable for some Europeans, it's sometimes done by orphans and widows and in poor houses, and because the native people who traditionally made it that lived on the coast are gone. Now they're not gone, gone. The Muncie people or the remnants of the Muncie people migrated inland, but the coastal makers are more or less no longer living on the coast and they're not making it. So Europeans take it over. There's still a demand on it in the interior, um, but they, um, uh, but the native people themselves partly walk away, partly lose the connection with the craft, and Europeans take it over. They're not forced out in the sense that the Europeans do it and, and the Indians can't do it, but I think it's more that the native people who are forced out in a different way, forced out of their lands, the refugees, they leave, they just stop making it and colonists pick up the pick up the craft. Yes, they do have two completely different understandings of what wampum represents. Although on the frontier, there are some interesting intersections where some Europeans really get it and and at least play with it um, in their diplomatic proceedings. And others don't understand, like Colonel Bouquet at all. Well, that's what I have for you. It was a whirlwind tour, um, and I saw lots of great questions that I wish I could have answered and addressed and talked with you. We could easily go on for another hour or two, obviously, uh, but I don't think Andy's going to let us do that. <laughs> I would love to be able to let you do that, Paul, but I know uh, and, and you're still probably light where you are on the West Coast. But I, you know, I think more than it that, is. What, what this is meant to do is inspire a conversation. I hope it encourages each of you to download the PowerPoint to start to pull pieces of this out and continue your interrogation. And before we're done, Paul, I'm going to actually ask you to answer one last question, and it's a little bit of a of a wild card question that I, I didn't prep you for in advance. <clears throat> but you know, I started tonight by talking about um, this body of knowledge as well as a way of knowing. And I wonder, if for you as an historian, as you approach this work with um, <clears throat> you and some several hundred years between you and the material, um, with, with the kind of material culture that you're working with, the kind of context. What, what would you say is, is sort of the critical habit of mind, the, the way that you approach this? How did you do this work? And what, what, um, what techniques do you use as an historian that, that, that we as teachers might think about replicating or at least, at least pointing at uh, when we work with younger students? Well, so, you know, some of them are the things we've actually done tonight in trying to interrogate these sources. Um, but for me... And given the nature of this project, I've really had to to do a lot more than just read sources. I've had to look at artifacts, uh, both what we call ethnographic wampum that's just passed down uh, from person to person and is mostly in museums or archaeological uh, artifacts. Uh, I've looked at a lot of pictorial evidence. I, I have, I'm staring at above my computer, a bulletin board that's filled with wampum in images, and probably one of the stories you might hear about me from the NHC is that my study was filled with um, what all that I could produce in terms of images that I surrounded myself with and a few material objects. I have some some shells uh, uh, and some actual wampum, historic wampum and modern day made wampum. And, you know, I don't know that... Uh, I don't know that I really feel like I've got a, a handle on, on what it means to study material culture, but I'm certainly trying to invest myself in the material culture. And I think if you, you know, if you can bring objects into the classroom, like I have a colleague that teaches ancient history, and she has these all these Roman and coins, which are actually not that expensive to pick up. She also does English history, and that's where a lot of these are found. Um, I think those are interesting moments for students to, you know, handle an object, even if it's not a true historic one, you know, replicas, and get them, give them a sense uh, of something that's alien to them, and ask them, you know, what is what is this like, and and right. what kind of people made this and handled it, and what are they thinking, um, and sometimes that'll help them. And one of the things I like about this project, like history generally, when you start thinking those ways, hopefully it makes us look at the things around us and the way we do things with new eyes. Like, you know, why do we have coffee mugs with handles the way they are? Or, you know, 
why do our computers look like they do? Or why do we have computers? And all any number of things that we're surrounded with that we take for granted as just utilitarian objects. But hundreds of years from now, archaeologists and historians will try to find will find great meaning in these things. That's a great answer. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And of course, uh, for you and the audience, for you in, in this conversation, um, follow Paul on Twitter, uh, go out to Amazon, see what he's up to these days. Um, and, and again, grab this PowerPoint and start pulling apart uh, the, the kinds of things that we need. Please continue to seed uh, this chat box with your questions. We'll be sure to um, have that in the final recording uh, of which you'll have access to. Um, I do want to also ask you to uh, pay attention to the National Humanities Center. Uh, we have many different social outlets in which we're sharing this kind of work. Uh, our Pinterest uh, board is, is active and has Libby's fingerprints all over it. Um, we've actually asked our uh, Teachers Advisory Council to, to each guest lead our Instagram account by month, and we're asking them to use different lenses of the humanities to see the community they live in and share that out on our behalf. You can see Laura Wakefield from Orlando, Florida in the right lower right-hand corner. Uh, this coming month, uh, Ginger Park from Colorado will be leading our Instagram. And I'm anxious to see the way that we can start to crowdsource uh, this from around the country. Um, and follow us on Facebook. Um, and when you do that, again, you tap into a community and a network, not just the folks presenting, uh, representing tonight, but the scholars that we work with and the, and the kind of uh, scholarship that we can represent. Our next webinar is next Tuesday night, Rock and Roll in American Fiction of the 1950s. Uh, it'll be in the same format. It'll be at the same time. Um, please go and sign up now if you haven't already, and you'll receive additional information from Libby's desk. Um, please be sure tonight to go to the survey, complete it, and you can immediately download your CEU certification uh, letter. And we hope to see you again very soon uh, with the work we do here at the National Humanities Center. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, good night. Um, have a great school day tomorrow.